Hello, and welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming by. Uh, we're going to get started with all sorts of 107-y things. Um, I have a couple of uh, things for you today. Uh, most notably, more Rhino. A um, couple of other things. Uh, before we begin, does anyone have any questions? All right. Are we sure? Okay. Excellent. Um, just a couple of real quick things. Um, one thing is that um, you may uh, have noticed that uh, I accidentally was a little late um, putting that video uh, up on Canvas. Um, uh, so apologies for that. Um, I just forgot. Um, but if for some reason that happens, I almost never forget to put it up on YouTube. So um, if you can't see it on Canvas, you might want to check the YouTube channel um, because everything kind of goes there first. Um, and then I have to post it to Canvas. So um, pretty much everything should be here. Um, almost immediately after I teach class, I go ahead and put it on YouTube. So like within a couple of hours, um, I would guess uh, it'll show up there. So that's just kind of a pro tip um, if you want to, you know, get ahead of what's happening in Canvas. Um, other quick things. Um, today we are going to be uh, continuing to look at Rhino. Um, I have today set aside for more form creation in Rhino, which basically means that we're going to stick to making stuff. Um, and then the following sessions on Rhino are going to deal with lighting and materials and rendering. So really not so much about how this thing is shaped or how it's modeled, but how we're sort of um, choosing to image it from within Rhino. So uh, go ahead and you know look for that uh, starting on Thursday. We'll get into lighting and then uh, we also uh, will then uh, spend some time on materials and rendering. Um, we also have kind of a bonus day. Uh, it doesn't say bonus day, but that's basically bonus day, um, which is really just um, time that I build into the build into the syllabus so that we're not feeling rushed. Um, so uh, I will probably come up with some sort of like new and exciting things to do. Um, we can certainly spend some time probably talking about 3D printing might be good. Um, and I can tell you maybe a little bit more about how to um, make stuff from Rhino. Uh, if you have any suggestions for things that you want to know how to do in Rhino, uh, I'm pretty open and flexible. So if there's something that you want to learn how to do, like I really want to make like a, you know, pattern for a harness for my cat maybe, that would be hilarious and fun. Um, really literally anything. Um, just let me know, shoot me an email and uh, I'll think about it um, and we can maybe work it in because we have some flexible time. So um, jumping kind of right into the sort of um, every day, remember that we worked in Rhino, I said I would bring you a project. Um, and so my project um, for you today is a project that I did, I guess 2016 maybe, I think is when it went up. Um, I say I made it in 2016. It's actually kind of hard to tell um, from my perspective because I worked on it for about three or four years. Um, you may be asking, Meg, why on earth would you work on something for three or four years? And I will say, mm, city of Madison permitting. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, got, it got held up in, um, in permit hell. Um, and so uh, really, I probably could have gotten it done in like six months. Um, but what it was is um, I was approached by the Museum of uh, Madison Museum of Contemporary Art here in town to do something with their rooftop uh, sculpture garden. Um, so I, don't, I wanted to make something that was actually living and changing. So what I did is um, I made this model of the rooftop. I don't know if anybody's ever been up there, but it's like a sort of public uh, plaza where they have a restaurant and then they have a over here is a movie screen where they show cinema, and then there's sculpture all over these little pads in the floor, sculptures and gardens. And it's a great place to be up in the summer. You know, you can go up there and chill, watch a movie, 
Um, they have kind of like lounge furniture set up. <laughs> um, and it's really supposed to just be a place where people can hang out and appreciate the sculpture. So what I did is I came up with this idea to take this garden box here and turn it into a productive, um, a productive sort of sculpture garden. Let me take care of the mood music here. Sorry about that. Um, so, so what I did was I uh, modeled these um, sort of beams, and then uh, I'm not sure if we can see this in the. This is actually like a concrete precast concrete wall, and then behind the precast concrete, uh, it's not shown in this rendering, but there's a series of winches, which are like um, little, um, you know, cranks that you turn, and then they turn rope well, metal ropes, um, stainless steel ropes that then these things push down. Um, and so what we decided to do with the space was we decided to gr actually grow hops up there. Um, and so you can see here, um, this was like the first year we grew hops in there. Um, and the hops actually did uh, make it all the way up to the top. And we had to collaborate with, this is probably the most collaborative project I've ever done because we had to work with an architect, we had to work with city planners, we had to work with uh, a structural engineer so that this would not like kill anybody and fall on their head, right? Um, so there was a lot of like, all that sort of like liability level of, you know, checking and having it ultra permitted and, signed off on by 500 people, <laughs> not 500 literally, but it seemed like a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, and really all we were trying to do was grow, grow hops. <laughs> so um, anyway, we ended up growing this, the hops and I had this installed that probably actually this day of installing it was probably like one of the most like childlike, uh, childlike happy days of my professional life, like, because they brought this big crane to, to um, install the beams and to start, you know, drilling into the precast uh, concrete walls. And um, when, when they brought the crane up, they, they let me drive in the crane, <laughs> which is totally worth it. Totally worth it. Yeah, that was like my unwitting Trump moment. Um, so anyway, I mean, I think that this is a really great example for ha of how you can, you know, make something real. Um, I did end up sending it to a fabricator. Obviously, I did not, like, make those in our tiny little shop up here. I um, actually worked with Findorf Construction. Um, I don't know if you've probably seen their signs around town. Um, and so the guy from Findorf um, was basically, like, their special projects division. And he took my models and he programmed the sort of equipment to cut them out of these, you know, aluminum pipes. Um, and then the winches, um, that part was uh, ass assisted by the original architect of the building. Um, and a structural, he was also a structural engineer. So it was a really fun project. I'm really glad I did it. It took forever. I honestly, like in retrospect, I don't know if public art is really right for me because you do have to kind of like work through this bureaucratic process of like, you know, making sure that it's safe. And <laughs> I mean, I'm just laughing because it's like, yeah, you want it to be safe, but you know, the, the level of sort of bureaucracy is pretty intense. Um, and so anyway, like I said, it did eventually get, get, um, get installed. And then after we made this hop garden for a couple of years, guess what we did? We made beer. Um, that's a whole other project, but I made like three beers um, in collaboration with the museum that you could buy at the grocery store. Like they sold them at Hy-Vee and Metcalf's. And uh, it was kind of crazy because I had never thought about putting my work out there. Of course, when you put it on the internet, you know a lot of people see it, but the beer cans, there were actually like 90,000 of them. And um, that was sort of like a different level of like, somebody's actually gonna see this and, and look at it, you know, rather than if you're putting something on the gram or whatever, you're just like, you know, adding it, adding it to the sea of, of stuff. Okay, so, so that's one project uh, made in Rhino. And um, jumping back into this, we're gonna kind of like start off exactly where we uh, left off. And uh, this is, this is exactly where we left off. Um, we were working on these sort of like narwhalish um, unicorn horn like thing. And so as I recall, we took a couple of circles, we moved them together. We then used this um, curve, 
curve edit tools curve boolean to kind of get this intersection of the circles or I guess this technically would be the union of the circles and everything else goes away. And so now we did one other thing. We went to uh, the surface menu and we extruded the curve to a point. And if you recall, I had a little bit of um, uh, angst sort of getting it to go to that right angle. So I went ahead and just made a little line uh, that was sort of on the, the, in the position that I needed it to be so that it would snap to that, that point. So now that we're here, um, we don't really need these curves anymore, although if I were smart, I would keep them. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and put them in my construction curves layer. So I went ahead and opened up my panel, and here we go, construction curves, change object layer. Um, yeah, that was fun. So that's done, and they're gone away now. Um, basically, what's left is to sort of twist this thing into shape. And I might have some things to say about the kind of overall dimensioning of it. Um, it looks a little thick on the bottom, but that's just my opinion right now. I'm gonna wait until it's twisted to kind of really figure that out. So I'm gonna grab this object. This should be a solid, by the way. Um, and then go to the transform twist. So these are all operations, by the way. Uh, these four, first four, anyway, are operations that you can apply to solid forms. So we're going to use the twist. And I guess starting at the top would be good. Um, it has a nice, distinct point at the top. Then it asks for the end of the twist axis, which in this case should probably be somewhere uh, straight down. So I'll go ahead and settle for that. Um, by the way, I had to press the shift key to put it in ortho mode to get it to go straight down. Um, then it asks us for an angle or first reference point. And so for this portion of the job, I would be in the top view. Um, and then basically what you're doing is you're just twisting it um, a couple of times. And so I'm just gonna leave it there. I will give you a strong hint, and that is whatever you see in this preview right here or right here is not really quite how it's gonna look. So don't get too, don't get too excited or too distracted by that. Um, and now you can see our sort of beautiful twist here. Um, a couple of quick things. Why did I make the pattern uh, lumpy? This pattern right here, why is it lumpy? Or why does it have, you know, any kind of shape to it at all? Uh, I'll give you I'll give you a very succinct answer. Because a uh, a twisted cylinder or a twisted cone is a cylinder or a cone. <laughs> um, it has to have some kind of like irregular shape in order for the twist to actually be visible. So um, yeah, otherwise. Believe me, I've tried um, twisting a cylinder, and you get, you get a cylinder. Um, so I'll go ahead and just uh, bring that back. So redo, redo. Oops, sorry, going in the wrong direction. OK, redo twist. OK, so could I make it a little bit denser? Yeah, sure. I mean, in other words, could I make it go more revolutions? I, I guess. Um, I think it's fine the way it is, though. I mean, it definitely says sort of like unicorn or something kind of bo vaguely biological. Um, I want to do a couple of things, though, with this, with this sort of twisty thing. I would like to sort of find a place for it in the boat. And so in order to do that, I'm just going to hide these for a second. And I'm just going to move it kind of straight into the boat and see where that gets me. Um, you can see it snapped down. So I'm going to just put ortho on and pop it back up to the top. Um, I may actually, while I'm doing that, just kind of center it on the bottom. Um, this was actually kind of what I was hoping for, was that I could get it to just intersect this bench, like sort of basically thinking that one person could sit here and one person could sit here. Um, yeah, so that's kind of where I was going with that. 
Um, let me go ahead and put this on the same layer um, as the boat. So right now we have our kind of basic boat, which is basically just the outside of the boat. Um, there is a, a sort of technique in Rhino where you can um, create a sublayer. Sublayers are nice for um, for just keeping things organized. Um, so I could add this uh, post to this sublayer by changing the object layer after I make it, and. Keep in mind that we did not keep that awesome blue color. We could probably go ahead and assign that. Um, also, of course, we have this cooler. So I'm going to go ahead and, oops, not that. Excuse me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and right click here to make another sublayer. And we'll call this one cooler. Um, this sort of uh, layer organization, it might not seem super important right now because we're just using it to kind of like hide things and show things. Um, as you get into Rhino a little bit more, um, you, uh, I'm just checking right now to see if the blue color is in the palette, and it looks like it is. So I should be able to just quick select it here. Yay. Um, so yeah, you don't want to get too sort of like down the rabbit hole um, of having things just um, all on the same layer or not having things organized. Because when you go to render things later on and you go to work with materials, um, a lot of the material functionality in Rhino actually works by layer. So it's technically, it's in your best interest to sort of divide things into layers early. Um, and it's mostly just so you can address things separately, but, but also together when you need, when, you know, according to the way you want to <laughs> deal with them and not Rhino's selection tools. So it looks like we've got um, now our sort of like post, cooler, bench, boat. Um, I was thinking to kind of take this even more in kind of like an imaginary direction that we would try to make giant wings on the boat that could be like see-through, almost like bug, bug wings or something like that. So, so let's do it. So um, in order to sort of think about doing this, I'm going to put up my top view, and I'm going to put up my front view. And I'm going to zoom out on the front view and the top view quite a bit, because um, these wings are going to be big. So I'm going to start with just a couple of curves. So these are like super minimal starting point. Now here. Um, I'm going to deal with this pretty closely to um, the way that I dealt with the construction of the boat in terms of just only dealing with one side at a time. Um, and then we'll go over to the other side. So when I'm kind of attaching these, these curve points, I do want to take extra care to make sure that they're somehow kind of attached to the boat. Um, because if you don't get them attached now, it's going to be way, way harder to get them attached later. So you can see here, this is just like, springing to near. Near is sort of like my default object snap for when I want something to just be like on something else, but I don't really care how. Um, that's what near is good for. So it's just going to draw it on a line. And in this case, it happens to be this side of the surface. So I'll go ahead and click here. Um, like I said before, when you're working with curves, you know, you can kind of just plot out a couple of points. And then, um, and then deal with them later. So you can see this from the top view, that looks like a pretty decent shape, kind of. Um, but from the front view, because we're working in the planar mode, um, so from the front view right now, it's like, bleh, boring city, super flat. So no big deal. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to come in here and click these points and start kind of like molding them into shape. And I'm really just going to make a few short changes. I might actually grab a bunch of the points at once and just try to elevate the whole thing up a bit. OK. So we're getting there. 
Um, again, you know, we want these to look sort of organic and three-dimensional, so we definitely wanted to kind of take the time to make them into that not flat thing. And so if we're going to start maybe the other side here, I'm going to start here, also attaching that thing. And I'm just going to actually maybe push these a little bit forward. And again, I'm not going to get too, like, too worked up about how they look right now, because I have the option of really getting in there and changing stuff. Um, in this case, by the way, I do want these to be independent of each other, like for their form to be independent of each other. So I would consider maybe disabling the object snaps while you're doing this, because otherwise the tendency is for one to sort of glom onto the other. Glom is a very sophisticated technical term, by the way. Um, yeah, that looks, sure, looks fine. So we could probably go with this. Um, my only sort of beef about this right now is that this curve just seems a little weak. Um, so maybe I could just accentuate it a little bit. There, that looks better. Um, all right. So now I need to kind of take these two lines and I'm going to make a surface out of them. And then we're going to kind of come into the surface and do some more stuff to it. So uh, first thing, I think probably this would be a great uh, case for uh, edge curves. Um, before we go up for edge curves, I'm actually going to put a curve that kind of terminates the shape on the outside. So I'm just going to draw from one point to another. And actually, this would be the time to turn back on my object snaps, because I just did something that I probably have told you all not to do, which is not to just click a point on a point without that confirmation of it sort of snapping, right? So because they do indeed need to touch in order for that edge curves to work. So I'm just going to go ahead and make kind of like a soft curve, hit Enter. And I'm going to double check in perspective that they're connected roughly. Um, I might actually go in here to the right view and just give this a little bit of a curve. Not like a huge amount. That was a huge amount. <laughs> um, that's better. Now, also, we don't want what just happened here, which is this sort of loop here. That is definitely going to mess things up. So there shouldn't be any intersection. That looks perfect. OK, so now I'm going to go for the edge curves option. And uh, it's in our surface menu. And it asks us to select two, three, four open curves. So there's our three curves. And then our last curve is the edge of this surface. So when you're sort of shopping in the, surf in the choose object menu, um, it doesn't really matter which edge you choose, um, but probably this top edge would be better. Doesn't really make any difference. And then we're just going to double check that it came out OK here. And yeah, looks great. So um, I'm going to take a look at it now. Um, I'm just now sort of like getting the feel for what it looks like at the surface. And one thing that I could say that I would probably like to do for, for later is to actually take this whole rail right here and just move it down a little bit so that it, it so you can see the edge of the surface more. Because here you're just seeing it kind of straight on. And I want to see it so that it, you're like looking up at it. So that's an easy fix. Just get this, get rid of this surface. That's the kind of stuff where you kind of can't really see it until you get into the um, actual surface. And I'm just going to take these four three points and move them back down a little bit. And then see how that looks with the surface edge curves. So that's just me being kind of picky. 
And there we go. So now we can see a little bit more of it, um, and that's fantastic. So could you do two separate wi uh, wings? Absolutely. Because of the burdens of time, we are going to go ahead and just flip this one and make it symmetrical. Um, but if you didn't want to do that, you could just make another one and make it slightly different, maybe. Um, I think this definitely would be a good place to consider doing that. We just don't, I don't have the time um, to kind of show you a variety of techniques. So um, let's see. So now uh, from here, we've got this surface. And what I was thinking was that we could take this surface and we could turn it into like, you know how bugs wings have like, sort of areas where the, I know nothing about entomology, by the way, um, but they have areas where they have like black opaque areas and then see-through areas, right, like windows. So I really wanna kind of get that sort of going in here. And I think that probably one of the things that I wanna, wanna show you how to do is to take this surface and actually uh, make curves out of it, and then we're gonna make something on the curves. So in order to take this surface, we're going to do curves from object. And we're actually going to click the Extract ISO Curve button. And um, I'm going to go in the other direction. You get two choices, so it's really easy to figure out which direction you want to go in. Um, it's based on UV coordinates. So I'm just going to sort of like draw a few of these in here. Um, and you can see that there's sort of, you know, perfectly um, adhered to the surface. But now I've got these three curves, and then I've got, are these curves maybe, kinda? N not right now. Right now they're a surface. But you can take this surface and you can pull the curves out of it um, by using, in the curve menu, uh, extract wireframe. So extract wireframe is kind of a really brilliant um, hack where you can take any surface and you can just pull any solid, actually, any poly surface, you can just pull the curves out of it and then use them for something else. So in this case, I think probably uh, taking all of these curves is what I'm looking for. I think I'm going to keep the surface there because the surface could be like made translucent. So I'll go ahead and pull these curves. Um, and now that I have all these curves selected, I could go over here to uh, pipe. Not that. It's under there. Um, pipe with flat caps. And right now, you can see our, our, our grid. Um, I think our grid is one large square is one. So that means that uh, I chose a really small pipe radius for this, like basically a 16th of an inch. Um, if you want a preview, you can kind of check on it. Um, and, excuse me. Um, basically uh, just go ahead and do it. So I'm gonna hit enter and it'll, ma it'll basically just generate pipes for the whole thing. Um, and pipes are probably one of the most useful things in Rhino, I think. Um, and now that we have this pipe, you can kind of see where we're going with this, um, that when we get to actually work with lighting, we could potentially think about, you know, maybe the maybe the structure part is maybe wood or metal, and then these sort of flat areas of the surface are like see-through, right? Um, kind of like a bug's wings. So probably at this point, I'm going to go ahead and just select the whole thing and group it. Um, and when I group it, I'm um, just going to group it over here. And then we can definitely um, go ahead and just take the whole thing and mirror it to the other side of the boat. So that's pretty similar to what we did before, where I'm just kind of using the front and the back of the boat to center those pieces. Um, and these will get more fun when we're sort of working with the modeling, for sure. 
Um, there was one quick thing I wanted to do to that post, but before we do that, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of put these away. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and make a sublayer for the boat, and I'm going to call it wings. And then I'm going to go ahead and choose that little icy blue color. Um, and of course, I did not grab them. So that goes in by a change object layer. And yeah, we're back in business. So there's a couple of little fixes that I want to make to this post. Um, I guess my main sort of observation is that it looks a little, a little big at the bottom. And so this is a sort of use case or a case that we haven't encountered yet where we're asking Rhino to basically scale something, but not on every dimension. So usually when we go into scale, which is over here, right, we sort of have this uh, concept of using scale as in like, I want to define a point, define another point, and make the whole thing smaller completely uniformly. But in this case, I think we actually want to do what's called a non-uniform scale, which I don't think we've done yet in this, in this class. So a non-uniform scale is literally, if you want to scale something and have it not be uniform, like x, y, z. So in this case, I think that our post is a little bit like thick around the bottom. And I think that we could definitely maybe just scale it to make it a little thinner. Um, but keep it at the same height, right? Um, because I think the height is great. So no problem. So we're going to go in here to um, scale 1D. And then it says select objects to scale. And then you hit enter. And um, in this case, I think I'm going to scale it completely from the top view. So I'm just going to find like a point that looks reasonable. And then I can sort of bring it in. Now, actually, I lied. Um, we want to do a two-dimensional scale. So one-dimensional is literally just one dimension. So if we do a two-dimensional scale here, it will make it uh, scale it on the x and y axis in this case. So select objects to scale. And then we're going to come in here. And now you can see it's sort of um, selecting it you know, based on the, <laughs> sorry, based on the um, thickness of the, of the thing. And so you can see it's kind of snapping to itself right now, which is a little bit annoying. Um, we could do that. We could change that. Well, here it looks, wow, it totally looks like a pacey freeze. Um, but anyway, we don't really want that. So. Um, let me, I'll just go ahead and select the points a little bit differently. So select objects to scale. Yes, please. And uh, I'm going to just scale it, uh, set my reference point a little bit further out. So that way I have a little more latitude before it starts, you know, getting into itself. Um, that looks like it's probably about 50, half, probably half as much. And now you can see it's a little bit more elegant. It looks a little more comfortable in, in here. Um, that's pretty much what I, was, what I was hoping for. So OK, so moving along, now we're sort of thinking about, I'm kind of thinking about two projects at once. I'm thinking about the impossible object, which, ta-da, this could be an impossible object. Um, your second assignment, by the way, is to make an environment uh, within that sort of context of the reality unreality. So, so f starting from now, we're going to sort of transition into this idea of like building an environment, thinking about how things fit in space with lighting and modeling, kind of like I planned it. So, so yeah. Um, basically, there's a couple of things we need to think about before we think about sort of putting this into some kind of environment. Um, probably the most obvious thing would be that if we create the floor of the environment or the ground, 
um, at zero, zero right now, that's going to cut off our boat. So probably it would be a good time to go ahead and uh, just pop it up to the level here. Um, and so that way, when we go ahead and draw, draw whatever the ground is, um, we won't intersect with it. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and just start to draw the ground. Um, and once we get our sort of ground and, and walls up, we'll start to think about maybe other objects that we want in the scene. So um, supposing that we have time. So I'm going to make a surface from uh, a plane, and I'm going to go from corner to corner. That is, in my opinion, the easiest way to create a surface in Rhino. It's like drawing a rectangle, right? Now, you may be asking yourself, Meg, that floor looks gigantic compared to your, compared to your uh, boat staying. Um, I would argue yes. Um, there's a reason for that. Um, mostly, it's because uh, I like to have options, and I also like to have, you know, options maybe with a horizon line. So this floor now is going to basically be seen as, you know, a horizon. So usually when I'm doing this type of work, my impulse is to make the space as large as possible. Um, can you, all, of course, in Rhino, you know, can you change it later? Um, yeah. So basically, I'm just going to make, uh, and again, scale really has no meaning um, with the way that we're working in Rhino. So I'm going to make another plane here. So what do I mean when I say scale has no meaning? Well, I mean that um, it uh, just putting grid snap on. Um, you can scale things however you see fit as you move along with the program. Um, so it's not going to really like help or hinder you. Might make some extra work. So I'll go ahead and make another plane. Um, someone might be rightly observing, uh, Meg, um, couldn't you just like make a box? Um, yeah, I totally could. Um, yes, is the answer. Uh, why am I not making a box? I don't know. I mean, if I made a box, I'd have to explode it. So there would be that kind of one extra. Um, I'm going to turn my, uh, take a look at some of these object snaps. Does it matter if my walls are perfectly aligned with each other? Not really. Um, because these walls are probably not even going to be visible uh, in the final piece. I mean, they will be visible, but only a small section of them will be visible. Um, so yeah, so I could just keep adding planes like this. Um, uh, let me go ahead and just show you the other way to do it, which is pot potentially a little more straightforward. Um, so I imagined I was one of you all uh, approaching me with some common sense. And uh, imaginary you said, why don't you make a box? And so. Like, OK, sure, let's make a box. So uh, really relatively large box, done. And now, of course, you might be sort of rightly observing, hey, there's a, a box plane in the way <laughs> of seeing this boat, um, to which I would say, yes, let's explode the box, and then we can get rid of some of these uh, extra surfaces that we don't need. Um, you may wind up only needing three if you were to sort of create your scene um, like against against sort of a backdrop like that. Um, and of course, we would probably want to go in a little bit more um, just so we don't have to like look at the imaginary nothing, right? Um, does Rhino have other potential options other than imaginary nothing? Yeah, they don't look that good. Um, you could like put a background image in there, I guess, or some other options. Um, but my advice would be just to kind of like try to make the camera encompass be filled with the environment. Um, so at this point, we could certainly take this whole sort of box object 
Um, we'll get back to it later, for sure. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just make it into a layer. And I think I'll call it, do, do. I think I will call it room box. And uh, I'll go ahead and load all those surfaces in there by using the change object layer. And now, uh, last thing, we probably will want to uh, lock that at, at least, um, because the box can be a real distraction um, when you're trying to model stuff. Um, but now you can see also our sort of boat just needs to maybe be grouped. Um, now, we may undo that when we go to actually make, um, make stuff with it. Um, I'm also going to just turn it slightly. So it's sort of facing in the right direction. And now we're pretty close to where we need to be. So something like that, only maybe a little more sort of landscapey should be good. Um, I will tell you one thing about sort of composing with the camera. You really don't want to get too committed to how this looks um, until you start getting into your render, rendering and materials, and particularly the lighting, because the lighting can affect drastically like where the visual weight might be in this scene. Right now, all of our visual weight is on the boat because it's lighter in color. Um, if we start to render this scene, it will be completely different. So I'm going to just render it as is. Um, we'll talk about uh, lighting and rendering. Sorry, I was premature. I have to click on this. Um, and then I'm actually not going to fully render it. I'm just going to go to the rendered viewport. Um, and you can see, basically, now we have our sort of, our sort of object with zero lighting, zero materials. It's basically like a white canvas right now for us to work on. Um, yeah. That's such a great question, because the, um, the rendering viewport uses what's called global illumination, which um, you can kind of tell just by looking at it. It sort of looks like there's diffuse lighting everywhere. Um, what it does is it's a technique where they uh, turn every object into like uh, something that bounces light. Um, and so global illumination is great. It's a way of like get, getting something done, you know, without like having to put your put your hand in it. Or, um, it does have definitely a very distinctive look, um, and it's very sort of like not dramatic at all. Um, so when you see uh, what we can do with real lights, I think it'll be really apparent. You know, like why global illumination is kind of like, uh. yeah. So the purple, um, when you're in a rendered viewport, none of that, it doesn't draw any of the layer color. So if you're looking for a way to temporarily turn off the layer color, using a rendered viewport is not a terrible way. So right now we're back in Ghosted. And you can see it's kind of like, wow, if I wanted to like dream that I was asleep on the SS Grimace or something, um, that would be great. But yeah. Well, I'm excited. Definitely, I'm not going to say that modeling isn't fun, because I think modeling is super fun. But uh, materials and lighting, more fun. Um, and we'll definitely like get kind of get into uh, lighting in the next class. I feel like there's one more object that we really have to add into this scene. I don't know what it is yet, but it will it'll come to me. You know, um, uh, maybe we could have like a little like garden of walrus horns or something. I don't know, um, something to sort of like add a little like continuity but variety into the scene. So, all right, gang. Um, I think I don't want to overload you, so we'll end on time here. Um, I'll see you on Thursday. Bye, everyone. <laughs>